morning, 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 everybody. How you doing? Welcome back to the Spurs Talk Show. I am Sean Butler. Bugsy Malone's up in front. You'll see her shortly. I hope you're all happy and healthy doing the things you love with the people that you love doing them with. Guys, please do me a favor. Smash the like button for me on the video, only if you enjoy the content, of course. Really appreciate all the support that's been going. We're just a couple of subscribers away from 23K. It's madness. Hit the notification bell and drop a comment. Let me know your thoughts. On today's video, guys, it's... January the 30th, a couple more days of the window left, and the news is somewhat drying up, but we do have a little bit to get through to kind of update you all on where we're at and where I see if any opportunities arise from. Let's start off with Antonio Nusa. Uh, the, the deal that was dead, it was going to Brentford. He was going to Brentford. I was devastated. I really liked the player, as you would know if you've been watching the channel, and thought... But Tottenham should have could have try, tried to find a way to get it done. Then the details of the deal emerged, and it was suggested that, in a nutshell, Brentford were willing to pay something like 35 million euros up front, up to 8 or 9 million euros more in add-ons, plus a 12.5% sell-on fee. I mean, an incredibly, incredibly juicy number for a guy who is just starting out his career. And at that point, I was a little bit turned off by the prospect and kind of understood that at some point you have to place you know, relative valuations on a player. You have to figure out in your mind, what is this kid worth? And to me, he hasn't proven it yet to the point where that is a justifiable figure. So I was less, less upset, less frustrated with the outcome. Then, of course, yesterday we find out that his medical failed. He failed the medical um, the details are since a little bit murky, but according to reports, he's got an ongoing back issue that needs to be managed. And on top of that, he his MRI flagged some sort of ligament, loose ligament issues in his knee, which would be quite a major problem. And so it looks like the deal for Brentford, for him to Brentford, is in serious doubt. And of course, then the, the noise starts to percolate on Twitter around whether or not you know, he would be, if there's a chance that he could end up at Tottenham. And for me, guys, like the answer should be no. As much as I do like the player and I wish him the best and I'm sorry to hear that he's, his deal is a little bit in jeopardy. You know, I, I think I don't have that much trust in our medical team uh, to resolve normal niggling issues like Ollie Skip's injury last year, etc. So, you know, I don't really want us to inherit a potential um, nightmare especially not at the cost and the valuations that, that Bruges have tried to place on the deal. And so I think potentially it's a bullet dodged. And yeah, I've changed my mind on it. You know, new information comes along and you have to reflect and be, be able to you know, be open-minded enough to adjust. And I think that when you look at the valuation of the player plus the, the injury you know, issues, I would be very, very concerned if Tottenham were to now try and step back in at the last minute and, you know, hijack the deal, so to speak. Um, Speaking of hijacking deals, there's a player that Tottenham have been linked to this morning uh, in the Daily Mail. And just before I walked out of the door, I saw people on Twitter, uh, I saw Sky Sports were talking about it as well, that Tottenham are trying their best to hijack Barcelona's £7.5 million deal for Swedish 17-year-old Jurgarden player. You know what? I can't even remember his name. I'd never heard of it. I think it's Luca Bagali or Luca Bagal, something like that. Um, I'll put the name on the screen. I'd never heard of him. Um, I've since done a little bit of research on to, into him and, and read the Daily Mail article. That's as much as I can give you guys. If, obviously, if, if the deal grows or intensifies in, in rhetoric, then I'll, I'll go and run him through the Y Scout tool. But apparently, 17 years old, broke into the um, Jurgarden team, who I, th I think they sit fourth in the Swedish league at the moment. And he's a midfielder, box-to-box -box midfielder, that can do... A lot of um, that has a lot of uh, lot, a huge amount of potential. Apparently, a brilliant passing range on him. I think he scored three or four goals and a couple of assists, maybe in 21 appearances for that team. Broke into the team. He's already made his appearance, his first team full debut for Sweden's men's team, getting 30 minutes recently. Very, very highly rated player. Don't know much more about him than that, other than the fact that apparently his footballing IQ, his ability to read the game is very good as well. So it's interesting, but that's about as far as I can give you right now. As I say, I will 
increase my interest in the story should the story grow in interest um, over the coming days or hours. We don't have very long left though, do we guys? We've got until, was it 11 o'clock on Thursday night, the first, four or midnight maybe, to get any final deals over the line. And it looks like Tottenham are probably done in terms of main main business. Although having said that, the noise around Conor Gallagher will not go away. Sky Sports, Lyle and Ben Jacobs and that lot are still pushing this narrative that Tottenham are still very much interested in Conor Gallagher and the valuation is still crazy high in my mind. And look, I'll, I'll be honest, I just I still don't understand the need to push for that transfer right now. First and foremost, he's got 18 months left on his contract. In the summer, he'll have 12 months left, which logic should dictate that whilst you might have to fight slightly more competition for him in, in the summer, there'll also be a cheaper price tag because the pressure's on, the, the, time is clock, the time is ticking, the clock is running down on his contract. So that should lead into the leverage that you would like to have. Second of all, you know, we, we're pretty much full strength in our midfield within about two games' time. On that note, Papsar last night, bittersweet as for Tottenham fans, uh, exited the African Cup of Nations on penalties against the Ivory Coast, the hosts. He scored his penalty, played very well in the game, but was devastated with the outcome. Obviously, as a Tottenham fan, I'm delighted he's coming back, but as a, a fan of the human, I'm sad for his, you know, for his, his loss, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, you feel bittersweet about it. Will he be back in time for Brentford? Absolutely not. I don't even think he's left the country yet. It's a long flight. He didn't finish playing until about 11 o'clock last night. I'd be gobsmacked if he was even on the bench tomorrow night. I'd even be surprised if he was um, starting against Everton. You'd hope he'd be back involved in the squad for Everton. But you know, I don't know what the club's policy is on the kind of winter break. The fact that all the other guys got four days off. You know, Are they going to afford the same for the international players? Maybe, maybe not. But in any event, he's back, so that will help us. And so when you're kind of looking at the rationale to sign a Conor Gallagher or any kind of main you know, midfielder, like the fellow from Atalanta that we were looking at as well, you know, is there that much need right now? For me, the priority should be, if we're going to do anything late that's here for this particular window, it should be in, in the forward line to give us some more creative options. We've got Bissouma coming back at some point in the next couple of weeks. We've got Salah will be back hopefully for Everton. You've got Benson Cross, Skip, Hoybier's not leaving. Right? That, not, that news also came out yesterday that he has turned down the advances of Leon, and consequently he's obviously not happy with the, the calibre of club that are interested in him right now. Tottenham are not interested in doing a loan to any of the bigger clubs. They want a permanent deal. And so, you know, as I've said to you a few times now, there's three elements to any transfer deal. Right? You have to have the buying club and the selling club agreeable on the terms etc plus you also have to have the the player that's willing to go to the to the club that, that is interested and it doesn't look like Pierre Mahoybier, um wants to lower his standards he wants to you know hold out for the right move and maybe that means writing his contract down to a degree we'll find out in the summer uh, but he will be here and so that obviously creates a bottleneck on the desire and the need of the club to go and get a central midfielder so I'm very surprised to see that Tottenham are still linked with Conor Gallagher despite the kind of reality of what's happened in the last 24 hours with regards to Hoybier's refusal to kind of to move on and with Pape Sarr coming back early. I'd be very surprised if there's anything in that, in that regard. Maybe Tottenham will still go after one of these sort of 17, 18 year olds or these youngsters and, and plan for the future. If it's not the Swedish kid that I just mentioned, then it may be uh, Hayden Hackney or Adam Wharton. Those sort of links are still percolating as well, but I think that's about as... As kind of as interesting as it's probably going to get in the midfield space, and obviously in the front line, you know, I personally think that that's where Tottenham need to focus. I think that we are lacking a lot of creativity, and someone like a Jota on loan could have been and would have been an interesting option who could do the things that we are looking for that we probably don't have enough, you know, value in at the moment in the players that are at the club. He looks like he's going to go to West Ham, um, and West Ham obviously are. You know, starting to move in some decent directions. They're starting to sign. They've got Calvin Phillips in. If they sign Jota, then I think you could make the argument. I think you could make the argument that until till that deal was done, that Tottenham won the January transfer window. <laughs> Even though there wasn't that much competition, I think you can make the argument that if any team had won it, it was probably Tottenham. But I don't know. Now, if you look at West Ham's uh, efforts, if they were to sign a Jota and Calvin Phillips. 
you know, that's a, it's a fairly decent window for them as well. And they obviously have ambitions to really go and move on in places. And we should be looking a little bit over our shoulder as much as we are looking forward and trying to chase down Aston Villa and Arsenal. Um, we have to be a little bit concerned because West Ham are a good team these days, a very good team. Hopefully their distractions in Europe will um, will keep their minds elsewhere and we can settle and land somewhere between third and fifth and guarantee ourselves um, you know, the top tier of European football next year. Shush. Um, so that's it really, guys. Without, without kind of an, another forward name em emerging into the January, the zeitgeist for this last couple of days, then... You know, it doesn't really appear like Tottenham's transfer window is going to end with a bang. It's more of a damp squib. And you know, to a degree, look, as a content creator, I always love to have something to talk about as we, as we approach deadline day. It's, uh, it's fun. But I'd also make the argument that, especially in January, as the deadline day emerges, these deals that sort of happen out of nowhere, names that spring up out of nowhere on deadline day, are usually more likely opportunities that have just materialize because of some some turn of fate some some chance that what no one's predicting and so what you can extrapolate from those kind of conversations or from those uh realities is that those players are not necessarily players that the club would have spent months or years investigating researching thinking about trying to figure out whether or not they are the right guy for our system and so you know, to me, if on deadline day Tottenham suddenly are linked with a player, a name that we haven't really heard about, then I only really feel comfortable about the prospect of signing someone like that on a loan deal. Now, I'm very much trying to keep my eyes on the bigger picture here. The fact that we're six months into a four, hopefully five, you know, or even longer year project. And you have to, you know, we've got a very specific system, a very nuanced style of play. And there's only going to be certain players that are going to be able to come in and understand that system quickly enough to have major impact. I'm very okay with the idea of us signing Timo Werner because it was only on a loan deal. And, you know, Ange Postacoglu believes that he's someone that can fit the system. And once he's learned it and understood it, he can offer value. If there's a player that suddenly creeps into our zeitgeist on deadline day purely because another new move materialized somewhere else in Europe and the domino effect kicked players, you know, into action into into conversations that wouldn't otherwise have happened then i don't feel like that's something that's been planned that would come across more as just an opportunity a chance signing and so given the nuances of what we're trying to do and how specific our requirements will be again i would feel uncomfortable about us signing these players on four or five year deals unless they've been part of the conversation part of the the, the, the discussion around what we're looking for for a longer period of time you know short-term solutions can lead to long-term problems and what I don't want Tottenham to do same within the midfield scenario you know is for us to sign a player now because we're without a midfielder or we were going to be without a couple of midfielders for a couple more games and commit to these long-term things it's unnecessary I think we've got enough full strength midfield options to be able to get us through I hope that with Sunny back we've still got enough with our forward line as well but if we are going to look for some area of weakness that we could do with some supporting for the next six months then it would be in the forward line and it would be out on the left or the right. I don't know if that's going to happen, but what I don't want is for us to go down the path of doing the opposite of, you know, that kind of uh, analogy of putting a band-aid over a bullet wound, the opposite of that, which is, you know, putting a plaster cast on a paper cut. I don't want us to commit to things that are short-term issues because it leads to long-term problems. That's it for me, guys. Not much else to talk about. As I say, Adam Wharton, Hayden Hackney, Jonathan Rowe, these, these sort of younger players, and obviously this guy from Sweden. Um, they are, if there's anything going to happen, I'd imagine it's one of those types of deals right now. But if something does change, I'll bring it to your attention. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Like, subscribe, and comment. And as always, bye-bye. <laughs>